What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So, we're gonna check out Bad Guys Wrestling Greatest Heel Turns. It's something great about a good heel turn a heel turn that you're not expecting, a heel turn that comes out of nowhere and it literally sets up months and months of entertaining television to the point where you want to see that person suffer you want to see that person get what they deserve man and we've had some really really great heel turns in the past few years so we're going to go down memory lane check out some of these iconic moments where you just once it happened you're like oh yeah we're we're in for a show and i'm looking forward to seeing this bad guy get what he deserves man so uh we're gonna check this out uh, another video with wrestling wrestle with andy link to the original video will be down below as always go give him a subscription if you haven't already he has plenty of dope wrestling uh videos you guys definitely Unless want to check your name out is ricky steamboat at some point during your wrestling career you're going to have to shift your alignment on the heel baby face chart well not john cena but you know <laughs> well i mean I, technically at one point he was a heel i think he when he started the 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 chain gang gimmick or whatnot the the thugonomics gimmick he was a heel at first and then he became babyface so i correct me if i'm wrong but i do believe that's how it went he was a heel and then he transitioned into a babyface and while it usually creates more opportunities to make money in merchandise if you go from being a villain to a hero, doing the opposite can be a lot of fun too, mm -hmm. as it allows performers to have a lot of fun during the process. But what are some of the best examples of this in wrestling history? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. So join us as we take a deep dive into Dark Side Wrestling's oh, greatest yeah. Legends. Let's do this. Of course, as always, if we're going to start anywhere, we really should do so with a big example. And perhaps Hogan, no bigger example of a successful heel turn in all of wrestling of history exists than the time Hulk Hogan dropped the big leg on Randy Savage yep. and formed the NWO. Hollywood Hogan, bro. Yes, this moment was One extra impactful because for over a decade... Honestly, you can say this probably the greatest heel turn of all time because it needed to happen because the Hogan gimmick, the, the goody two-shoe gimmick wasn't working and people had gotten tired of it. So it needed to happen, and when it did, it it created waves, especially for prior WCW. To it, the Hulkster had been the ultimate babyface, someone so popular he was able to rocket the industry into its first boom period and become a bona fide pop culture phenomenon in the mm -hmm. process. Seriously, whether you watched wrestling or not, everyone knew who Hulk Hogan was in yep. the 80s. The only problem with that, though, was that as the 90s came around, fans were starting to tire of his antics as they'd grown pretty repetitive and stale. Mm -hmm. On top of this, those same kids who'd originally served as Terry Bollea's Hulkamaniacs were now a little older and looking for something edgier to get behind, something they would soon find in the likes yep. of Stone Cold Steve Austin over on Raw. But before Austin could really take off, it would be WCW who first stoked the flames of the second boom period when, after a couple yep. of years of getting routinely booed by fans in the Southern Wrestling promotion, it was decided for Hogan's sake that the best thing to do was to turn him heel. Sure, he may have been hesitant to go with this at first, he definitely but once was. he was convinced by at the time WCW boss Eric Bischoff that it was the right idea, he went down to the ring during the match pitting Kevin Nash and Scott Hall against Macho Man Randy Savage, Lex Luger, and Sting at July 7th, 1996's Bash at the Beach and shocked the world by siding with the heel invaders. Mm -hmm. Hell, so shocking was this that fans in attendance immediately began raining garbage down on the ring. And, and that's when you knew. It was a hit because people were mad. And that's all. Oh, I'm pretty sure everybody in that ring, he knew, uh, we got him. It's over. They're throwing trash. We got him. It's over. As Hogan got on the mic and told them all to stick it. But why did they react so viscerally if they were already booing him? Well, as it turns out, Hulkamania was a lot like that favorite toy you had when you were a child. Sure, you might think you're too old for it after a certain point and so don't want to play with it anymore, but as soon as your parents gave it away, you're bound to miss it. Uh -huh. Basically, everyone watching that night suddenly remembered how big a part of their childhood the Hulkster had been, and so seeing him now reject them hit them in a way they weren't anticipating. Yep. And the anger this created helped to propel WCW to an 83-week winning streak in the ratings against their competition uh -huh. as the NWO angle became, for a while at least, 
the best thing in the industry by a country mile. For sure. But it wasn't the only time Hogan was involved in an iconic heel turn, of course. That said, on those other occasions, he'd be the babyface getting turned on. Yes, as the top star of 1980s WWF, everyone wanted a shot at Terry Bollea and his world title, which was exactly why mm. Andre the Giant decided to step to the dark side in 1987. And like with the prior example, the reason this one hit so hard was because for years before that, fans in New York were conditioned to see Andre as nothing less than a perennial babyface, someone who they could always cheer for no matter what. Mm -hmm. Come the time of WrestleMania 3, realizing his career was winding down and that he'd never been able to win the WWF title, the Frenchman decided to get mean in order to secure his final shot at the prize. So that was why, during a segment where Hulk Hogan's then three-year-long WWF title run was being celebrated by the... Three years. <laughs> uh, crazy. It's what we're dealing with now with Roman. <laughs> the kayfabe WWF president, Jack Tunney, the giant confronted him with Bobby Heenan in tow, informing him that his time was up. Then, in order to solidify yep. this point, he tore the crucifix chain off Hogan's neck, with his reasoning being that the Hulkster had hogged the spotlight for too long and that now it was Andre's turn. And you all know what happened next. The two titans clashed in the Pontiac Silverdome a couple of months later in front of an alleged 93,000 fans, uh, with the moment where Hogan slammed Andre still being considered by many to be the most iconic scene in the history of the industry. Sadly, though, the Giant wouldn't be able to get the title that night, though he would get a brief token reign a year later, which at least meant he could check such a goal off his bucket list. Of course, when it came to the man who won the belt after him, however, well, he'd have a much longer run on top. A run which eventually led to him going heel on Hulkamania, too. Mm -hmm. Who are we talking about here? Like oh, yeah! Randy Savage. Yes, beast. while the WWF title had been vacated following the controversy surrounding Andre winning it at February 5th, 1988's The Main Event, a new champion was to be decided in a one-night tournament at WrestleMania 4 a month later. And it was at this event that the Macho Man finally rose <laughs> to the top and took the belt for his own. But even with him now being the supposed star of the company, he oh, soon yeah. realized he was still second <laughs> fiddle to the Hulkster in the grand scheme of things, as over the course of the next year, he wouldn't main event a single pay-per-view, and he'd usually be cast as the tag team partner to Terry Bollea. Needless to say then, this eventually caused frustration to build up within him, frustration which was only intensified after Randy came to believe that Hogan had eyes for his wife Elizabeth. Mm, so really, yeah. it should have come as no <laughs> surprise when, at the main event 2 on February 2nd, 1989, the champ finally snapped and attacked his partner as the Mega Powers formally yep. exploded in front of everyone's <laughs> eyes. And with the pair now at odds, it meant that the obvious place to book the showdown between them would be at WrestleMania 5 the next month, a match which probably represented the high watermark of the golden era overall. Hell, so successful was both this bout and the Mega Power story around it, it's still to this day widely considered to be one of the greatest angles in wrestling history. Of course, it's only remembered as well as it is because of that iconic heel turn where Savage lambasted Hogan for having lust <laughs> in his eyes, something many <laughs> believed he was justified in believing, as the Hulkster had always been something of a secret heel. But he wasn't anywhere near as justified in becoming a villain as our next subject ultimately was, because when Shawn Michaels faked an injury in order to win a match in the spring of 2008, it incensed Chris Jericho so much, he had little other choice but to go to- Hey bro, this is one of my favorite heel turns, Chris Jericho's heel turn, oh, 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 oh this was so good, this was good. This was good. <laughs> to the dark side in order to get even. Let's rewind for a second, though, in order to give some more context. Basically, after retiring Ric Flair at WrestleMania 24, Shawn Michaels found himself being targeted by the Nature Boy's old stablemate, Batista. And so heated did the subsequent feud between the two get that at a certain point, a special guest referee was called to officiate their match at April 27th's Backlash in the form of Chris Jericho. As far as Y2J was concerned, however, he had no favorites in this beef. No, he only wanted to call things right down the middle. So when HBK faked a leg injury in order to get the advantage and the eventual win that night, the first ever undisputed champion couldn't figure out why fans continued to cheer for him. Uh -huh. So really, it's easy to see why the Canadian decided to reject fans at this point and morph into a new character, one which refused to give them anything they wanted anymore. 
and this included no longer having his loud, garish promo style or his colorful ring entrances. No, instead, he would wear a suit and tie to yep. the ring and speak softly, a move which was heavily inspired by both former AWA world champion Nick Bockwinkle and the character of Anton Chigurh from No Country for Old Men. And it worked because he wasn't the Jericho that the fans love. He was methodical in how he said things, and he was, he was you know, he would... He would tell you off in such a like condescending way with his suit. Like he came off like I'm better than you. You guys are scum. I love this. This was such a good heel turn, bro. But while this was initially designed to be unpopular with fans, it ended up being the best thing Jericho could have done in the long run because it completely reinvigorated him and turned him into a true main eventer in Vince McMahon's eyes for the first time in his career. On top of that, the subsequent feud he had with Shawn oh, Michaels was so good, it still so has good. to rank among the best of all time to this day. Facts. In fact, if you really wanted to, you could make a solid argument that this was the high point of Y2J's career in general. In my opinion, I wouldn't get mad if you said that, because this feud was so good, and his his heel turn at this point was so... It just worked. It, it really did work. The whole situation with him legitimately, accidentally punching his wife in the face, Sean Michael's wife in the face. Oh, chef's kiss. Just, I know this messed up, but it just was just so good. Because it's like, oh, you wanted to see, you wanted to see Jericho get his ass beat. Like, oh, nah, bro, beat the crap out of him, HBK. <laughs> of course, if rumors are to be believed, over in AEW, he's on the verge of starting what's sure to be another career-defining program as he becomes the surrogate for the elite by feuding with CM Punk upon his return to Jacksonville. And yeah, if Punk returns as a heel here, as happening. some suspect he might, it so, wouldn't be a role he's he a straight... He filmed this, obviously, before Punk uh, came back, but yeah, this is definitely not happening. So. Danger two. No, quite the opposite, in fact, because back in 2012, he had an all-time great villainous turn yep. when he laid out The Rock with a GTS on Raw 1000. But why was this so impactful? Well, it was because it came right in the middle of his legendary 434-day... To be honest with you, even though this is a good heel turn, the my favorite out of his heel turns was when he turned on... when he cashed in on Jeff Hardy. That's my favorite version like his my favorite heel turn from CM Punk because it, it it worked it made sense him cashing in on Jeff even though Jeff's the ultimate baby face I mean he had the money in the bank briefcase I love that the hit the back and forth he had with Jeff was fantastic I love that heel turn run with the WWE title yes this reign was so long that needing to freshen things up at a certain point cool mo d punk decided to shift allegiances after a while in order to stay at the top of his game and who better to turn heel on than one of the most it popular wrestlers did of all work. time then after all if you want to get maximum impact from anything you do you go after someone with the star power of the rock but this was more than about just targeting a big star, of course, because only moments prior to eating a go to sleep, the Great One had announced his intentions to fight whomever the WWE Champion was by the time the following year's Royal Rumble rolled around. So seeing perhaps the greatest threat to his title reign yet, the Second City Saint realized he needed to establish dominance early and that the best way for him to do this was with a well-placed knee to the face. Sure, it would eventually come back to bite him, as at the Royal Rumble the following January, The Rock yeah, we knew the, the Rock was going to win. But prior to that, it gave him a fresh coat of paint for the next six months in between, <laughs> where he now got to take on a whole host of babyface challengers, such as Ryback and John Cena. And it also meant that once he returned to the babyface side of the equation in the summer of 2013, audiences everywhere were more than happy to have him back on their side, mm -hmm. as it felt new all over again. Of course, it wasn't long after this that he'd be gone altogether, something which left a huge hole in the main event scene. Luckily, though, that hole would eventually be filled up by The Shield, up until the point that oh, Seth Rollins did the unthinkable yeah. and broke the band oh, up by turning heel that So was. good. <laughs> yes, between 2012 and 2014, there were few more popular acts in wrestling than the Hounds of Justice, because good. whether heel or babyface, they were always booked as a completely dominating force. And because of this, then, all three of their members, Rollins, Dean Ambrose, and Roman Reigns, were quickly accepted by fans as major players in waiting. But despite them seeming unbeatable, everyone knew the split was coming sooner or later as management clearly had plans to go with Reigns as yeah. the next top singles star. 
The only question was when would it happen and who would be the one to instigate it? A question which was finally answered on the June Great 2nd, 2014 time. episode of Raw. So good. When the architect broke everyone's hearts yep. by laying out both of his <laughs> stable mates with a steel chair. <laughs> Why had he done this? Well, seeing better opportunities for himself if he joined up with the villainous authority instead, Rollins decided he no longer needed his old friends. And while it wasn't a popular decision as far as fans were concerned, it's hard to argue it didn't work out well. It as worked later out that month, well. He'd win the Money in the Bank contract, a contract he eventually cashed in on during the main event of WrestleMania 31 in March of 2015 to become WWE champion. Really, then, for this reason alone, it has to rank as one of the most successful heel turns mm -hmm. of all time, though it doesn't make it hurt any less that we'd have to sacrifice one of the greatest stables of all time yeah. in order to get there. Yes, while the Shield would reunite a couple of times in the years following, it would never be the same as it was that first go-round. Uh -huh. Still, you could argue its original purpose had been served by now anyway, as all three members are amongst the top stars in the industry, even if Dean Ambrose has since reverted back to his old name of John Moxley over in All Elite Wrestling. Mm -hmm. And he's not the only former WWE star who's currently riding high down in Jacksonville at the moment. No, his fellow Blackpool Combat Club member Brian Danielson is doing the same as it happens. But before he jumped ship and became All Elite, he was having a career highlight run and of this his was own. Good when too. in late 2018, he introduced fans to the new Daniel Bryan. Yeah. Of course, the reasons this one was so notable was because only a few months prior, the American Dragon had returned from a career-ending head injury and picked up right where he left off as WWE's most beloved babyface. Seriously, if you wanted to find someone else who had such a natural connection with live crowds as Brian did at this point, you'd have to go back to the days of Mick Foley and Eddie Guerrero. That's how over he was. I, I want people to understand. He was genuinely attitude era levels of over. He was. He was. And just being able to witness that, was it was, it was a special time, man. And that's what made it all the more impressive that, on the November 18th, 2018 episode of SmackDown, he was able to get the same people yep. who hijacked WrestleMania on his behalf to boo him when he turned heel on AJ yep. Styles and stole the WWE title from him. Sure, you could argue that this was a baffling move as there was still plenty of mileage left in going with the Washington native as a top babyface, but in the end, it worked out for the best as the new Daniel Bryan proved to be the most entertaining person on the roster for a while. Fact. Seriously. Whether it was lambasting fans for eating meat, having a dream match against Brock Lesnar, or creating his own custom-made hemp title. And it was crazy because he was a heel going against Brock Lesnar, who essentially, in the fans' eyes, was a heel. <laughs> and in that match, in that particular match, he was a babyface. That was a fantastic match, bro, by the way, if you guys haven't seen it. Daniel Bryan versus Brock Lesnar, that was a fantastic match. I believe that was at a Survivor Series. I can actually Google this right now. I believe that was a Survivor Series match. Let me double check. I'm doing this right now, y'all. Hold on, we're going we gonna to get to this one. I believe that was a... Um... Uh, yeah, champion versus champion match. Yeah, Brock Lesnar versus Daniel Bryan. And at the time, people didn't really care for Brock Lesnar being the champ because we didn't really see him there. But in this instance, even though Daniel Bryan was a heel, he was cheered like a babyface when he kicked Brock Lesnar in the cojones and <laughs> kicked him square in the balls. Pause. The fans cheered. He cheat. He tried to cheat to win. And... That's, that's, man, crazy time. Fantastic magic. If you haven't seen it, man. This new heelish incarnation of the WWE champion proved to be a masterstroke. And it even saw him get to flip the script on his own iconic WrestleMania 30 moment yep. when, at the showcase of the Immortals in 2019, rather than play the conquering hero overcoming evolution, Bryan played the dastardly heel standing in the way of Kofi Mania. So when he fell to Kofi Kingston at this show and lost the WWE title to him in the process, mm -hmm. it created a moment so iconic it'll likely still be talked about for decades to come. For sure. That said, it remains to be seen if it'll be as iconic as the next heel turn we're about to discuss, because even if it happened all the way back in 1980, old school fans still remember the time Larry Zbysko turned on Bruno Sammartino. 
Okay, but this why is going to be new for me. But as much as it is? Well, that's because for years beforehand, Bruno had been the real-life mentor to Zabisco, someone who'd begun training him in the early 1970s. Oh, I think I did. And who'd then stood by his side while he worked his way up. I think I did see a video talking about this. Of the ranks of WWF over the rest of that decade. Of course, while Larry was making a name for himself, though, it was San Martino who was standing tall as the world champion for most of this period. So when 1979 rolled around, as the student decided he wanted his shot at being the top dog himself, he'd have to challenge his teacher in order to earn this. Not that Bruno had an issue giving him his shot, of course. No, as always, the Italian was someone who took on all comers. What he did have an issue with, however, was that following their subsequent bout on January 22nd, 1980, Zabisco attacked him with a wooden chair Jeez. after being unable to get the win. And he wasn't the only one who had an issue with this because, with it being an era where kayfabe was still a closely guarded yep. secret and some in the audience continued to believe what they were seeing uh -huh. was real, the heat for Larry going forward was nuclear. Yep. But of course, behind the scenes, Bruno and Larry continued to be good friends, enough to where, during their subsequent program throughout the remainder of the year, San Martino made his opponent look consistently strong, even if he never did beat him. That said, Zabisco would always be able to hang his hat on the fact that his heel turn was so successful, it drew over 36,000 fans to Shea Stadium Ooh. on August 9th, 1980, that Damn. then proceeded to watch him take on the champ in a bloodbath of a steel cage match. And the whole thing also served the dual purpose of helping to keep Bruno strong enough to the point that, even if he'd already dropped his WWF title to Bob Backlund by then, he was still seen by many as the real top star of the promotion. So perhaps this fact stuck in Backlund's brain and gave him a chip on his shoulder he never forgot about then, because years later in 1994, he'd finally snap when he came back to show the next generation how it was done, and was in the process disrespected by Bret Hart, mm. at least as far as he saw it. That's right, it was during the New Generation era that following a return to New York, former WWF champion Bob Backlund found the landscape looking very different to the way he'd remembered it. And this was because he was no longer the technical wizard respected by all his peers. No, that spot had now been taken from him by the hitman. So, angry over this, and angry over the perceived lack of honor this current generation had, Backlund turned heel on the fans, and in doing so, became the most interesting he'd ever been. Yes, while he may have been a big draw in the early 80s, that was all based on his matches. As far as his promo skills were considered, though, they were always a little more vanilla, which was <laughs> why it came as such a surprise he had a great character like Mr. Backland in him, a character which basically amounted to a crazy old get-off-my-lawn type figure <laughs> who felt the need to preach the old ways of doing things at all times. Of course, this led to him challenging Brett on a number of occasions throughout 1994 and 1995 then. And it was during one of these that, with a little help from Owen Hart and a well-placed towel, yep. he actually managed to beat the Hitman to win the WWF title for a second time. Sure, this title reign proved to be short-lived, as just three days later he'd lose it to Diesel in eight seconds at a Madison Square Garden house show. Damn. But even if that was the case, the very eight fact seconds? he'd been Jeez. given the ball to run with again at all proved just how successful the Mr. Backland character had been and just how much longevity it ended up adding to his already storied career. That said, this is small time compared to the longevity a heel turn has given our last subject of today, because heading back to the current time uh, period, despite yeah. struggling to get over in any meaningful yep. way while he was the happy-to-be-there, white-meat, baby-face son of Rey Mysterio... We just literally watched a video talking about Dominic Mysterio and his ascension to the biggest heel in the company right now, man. As soon as Dominic Mysterio turned on his father uh, and joined the yeah. Judgment Day, he unlocked something within him which instantly transformed him into a star. And yes, part of this was that he was now in on the joke of him being spoiled while growing up. Yeah. Hell, so hard did he lean into this aspect of himself following his fall to the dark side, it soon became the thing people loved the most about him. But then, how couldn't it be? Because seeing Dom spend a night in prison, only to then come out of this situation <laughs> acting like a man who's seen hard time, is so, so entertaining good, that it's almost hard to <laughs> boo him. And when you combine this with the fact that his ambiguous relationship with his mommy, Rhea Ripley, has been the most entertaining thing on Raw in years, it's a surprise he hasn't been turned back babyface yet. Yes, we're sure this no. will happen eventually, as like with all the Keep best heels, his final as form is inevitably going to be getting over in a big way as a fan favorite. 
but before that happens, he can rest safe in the knowledge he's doing his job so well that the heat he receives on a weekly basis is often nuclear. Yep. And what an achievement that is for someone who, only a year ago, felt like a lost cause. The next incarnation of other failed second-generation stars mm -hmm. such as Eric Watts or David Flair. We suppose it just goes to show how effective a great heel turn can be then. Yes, as we've seen today in all the examples we've looked at, if you're ever in need of refreshing your character, you don't need to create a new move set or even come up with a new entrance theme. No, yeah. All you have to do is tap in to your dark side. Yes, sir. It works every time. It seems like WWE, they are great at booking heels for the most part and baby faces. They, 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 they're not that good at booking them. <laughs> so if you need a character change, turn heel. If it makes sense, people will buy into it. It works. <laughs> so comment down below. Let me know. Who do you feel like on the main roster right now needs to turn heel? Who do you feel like could really benefit from a heel turn right now? Could definitely help out their uh, their character as it's going right now. Let me know down below. But I appreciate all love and support. Guys, show on channel Road to 150K. And I'm still Young Speedy, YouTube wrestling champion of the world. Appreciate y'all kicking with me. See you in the next one. Peace.